thing here. So let's get at some homework. So I've numbered these just like they are in your book. So you could go look at them uh, just as they are in the book. And this is an overview. I'll introduce some of the basics, but then you'll need to go read about it as well, obviously. But this is relatively basic stuff, just preliminary things uh, about estimation, conversion, uncertainty. So these are all things that are be important in all of our computations. So we're just setting the ground. Uh, so this is expected stuff in physics, unlike the last activity. All right, so how many heartbeats are there in a, laugh, in a lifetime? In a lifetime, too. Uh, sometimes I'll ask questions where you must make some assumptions. Okay? Uh, you'll see some questions in a couple of weeks where I won't even ask a question. I got some problems, rather. You just, here's a situation, model it. That's real life, because you're not, it's not like you're going to get a workbook when you get your first job. Fill out these questions, you know. You're going to have to take the data and do whatever, do something with it, meaningful. And then we'll ask regular questions. So get all the above. Anyways, heartbeats in a lifetime. Well, what do, we, what do we have? Well, everybody has one lifetime. We absolutely have a lifetime. Okay. How many heartbeats are in a lifetime? Well, let me ask you this. Uh, how often is there a heartbeat, average person? Just resting heart rate. Probably 60, right? So it's probably about... We probably have one heartbeat a second. At least that's, that's in the ballpark. If you're an athlete, you have less than one heartbeat a second because you have a resting heart rate of 50 or so. If you're excited or out of shape, you might have a resting heart rate of 80. Okay, so uh, a good assumption would be one heartbeat a second. We don't have to make, we don't need it to be perfect. All right, we're making an estimation. So. The trouble that y'all will have, especially if you're an engineer, is you, 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 you're just so nerdy, you have to have it be like NASA laser beam perfect, and that's just not the way it works. Okay, this is a back of the envelope calculation. All right, so we got the back of our head. I would expect about one heartbeat a second. Well, how many seconds are there in a lifetime? Well, anybody have a calculator? A couple of you get out a calculator to see if we can get the same number here. So we know that on average, everybody lives to be about 80 years old, all right? And we know that um, uh, so 80 years, okay, times, well, how many days are in a year? So there's 365 and a quarter days per year. And how many uh, hours in a day? Right? And how many, uh, there's like 3,600 seconds in an hour, right? 60 minutes times 60 seconds. So this looks a lot like that railroad track business. So the years die, the days die, the hours die. Now I have seconds. If you multiply 80 times 365 times 24 times 3,600, you should get something that's about 10 to the 9. Some number of billions, right? So we have some number of billions of seconds in a human lifetime. Whether it's 60 years or 100 years, we're going to have basically a single digit billions of seconds in a lifetime. All right. So we could just say 10 to the 9 seconds per lifetime. So 10 to the 9 seconds per lifetime times, uh, what was it? one heartbeat per second. So here we are, our lifetime unit drops, second drops, and what do we get? We get 10 to the ninth uh, 
heartbeats. So if you made a different assumption, you might get two times 10 to the nine heartbeats. Like if you said there's a billion seconds per half lifetime or two billion seconds per lifetime, we'd have two times. So if you were trying to be more precise, like uh, what was the actual number of billions? 1.3 or something? 2.5. So if you'd have been more precise, we'd have 2.5 billion heartbeats per lifetime because we guessed one per second, which is probably correct on average. All right, it's close enough. Okay, so this is kind of this is the kind of question you must make an assumption. Got to justify the assumption, and the math is arithmetic. There's no rocket surgery involved. All right, that's the purpose of a question like this. As much as possible, I try to explain to you why I do anything that I do. Okay, and sometimes it makes perfect sense why we would do it. Other times, not so much. Okay, and if I didn't say anything about this problem, you're like, the heck does that have to do with physics? It's just busy work. All right, it's more about a skill than obtaining a particular value. But one example of this, and I think they mention it, uh, a guy named Enrico Fermi, he worked on the Manhattan Project and he did a back of the envelope calculation and he was ready for one of these nuclear tests where they're standing miles away, got their little glasses on. And he had a handful of confetti and he was, he says, I'm gonna, as soon as I see the flash, I'm going to count and, uh, when I feel the uh, shock wave, I'm going to drop this confetti. And he had already worked out that based on how far away that confetti um, goes, based on how long it took for the thing to get there to blow the confetti, what the yield of that bomb was. And he had he did it so good that he his order of magnitude was correct. His factor was wrong, but his order and but he didn't care. He just wanted was the order of magnitude right. And so that's a back of the envelope calculation. You don't, all I wanted to know was, dude, do we have the right idea? He could know right there on the spot. He didn't have to wait till he got back to the lab. He could know right on the spot, yes, we are basically right. And then you go get precise later on. So you'll do that as a scientist or engineer. You'll just do these kind of proof of concept. Does it pass the smell test? And then we'll get to the details later. So that's this kind of problem. That's why this is a useful problem is that you will do something like this in reality. All right, here's another one that's, there's no real formula for this. This requires proportional reasoning. All right, how many times longer than the mean life of an extremely unstable atomic nucleus is a lifetime of a human? Hint, the lifetime of this unstable nucleus is 10 to the minus 22 seconds. That's 100 billionth of 100 billionth of a second. 10 to the minus 11 is 100 billionth. Just give you a clue about what 100 billion would mean. There are 100 billion galaxies in the visible universe, each with about a, some hundreds of billions of stars. So that's the big side of 10 to the 22, the plus side of it. So one over 10 to that. So it'd be like one star out of all the stars in the visible universe. That's the size fraction we're dealing with here, all right? So not a formula here, it's a counting exercise. It's a ratio. I'm gonna count how many of something are in something else. So that means I'm gonna divide. And so I'm gonna have the time associated with a heartbeat relative to the time associated with an unstable nuclei. We just determined that the time there's like, uh, it wasn't two, um, I was talking about that. So one times 10 to the nine seconds, that's how many heartbeats uh, there are. And then there's this 10 to the minus 22 seconds. So if you do this math, you basically get 10 to the 31 times. So human beings live 10 to the 31 times longer than an unstable nuclei. Is this useful information? No, it's totally useless information. It's the process that matters. Later on, when we get to momentum and energy and whatnot, then these sorts of ratios and the exact same thinking will matter and be meaningful. Sort of like the Fermi example, all right? So 
Uh, that one's a bag. Calculate the number of cells in a hummingbird. Assuming the mass of an average cell is 10 times the mass of a bacterium. And uh, somewhere in your book, it tells you what the mass of a bacterium is. So let's do part A here. And I'll just give you the value. All right, so again, what do we have? We have 10 to the minus 2 kilograms per hummingbird. Anybody familiar with that railroad track conversion method like you might assign chemistry? That often comes up. And really all you're doing is you're taking fancy forms of one, like, and you're just flipping them so that you cancel out. So, all right, so uh, I'll fancy form of one. So for example, just a little side note. If I had, uh, you know, one kilometer equals a thousand meters, that's a definition. And if I divide both sides by one kilometer, then I have one equals a thousand meters per one kilometer. That's a fancy form of one. What happens when you multiply by one? Nothing. So we, these fancy forms of one uh, are productive in transforming quantities into other things. And there's more to say about a fancy form of one. That's just sort of a practical way at it. It'll be a big part of our lawmaking uh, game when we get to it. So there's 10 to the minus 2 kilograms per hummingbird. And according to one source, you have roughly 10 to the minus 15. Um, I'm sorry. I need to put that. One cell has uh, 10 to the minus 15. 15 kilograms or that second one would be read it there a fact would be there's 10 to the minus 15 kilograms per cell just reading it upside down all right but what i wanted to do was find out what is the number of cells in a hummingbird if based on what a cell mass is all right so of course kilograms die um, and uh, we we move on, and so what we get is roughly 10 to the 12 cells. So that's a trillion cells in a hummingbird. Human beings have trillions of cells because we're kind of bigger than hummingbirds, all right? But hummingbirds are kind of hollow. They're, there's not a much to them, so... Uh, anyway, so that's why they fly so well. So just proportional reasoning again, makes some exception how many cells are there in a human. And so you have uh, 100 kilograms per person. That's a 220 pound person. Just the easier number to work with. All right. I'm almost 100 kilograms grams myself unfortunately i'd like to be more like 90 but anyways uh and same thing there's uh, uh, ten to the minus 15 kilograms per cell and that works out to 10 to the 16th i'm sorry 17 I guess I should have, uh, I was, what I was supposed to write, but I'm not going to, is uh, these were 10 times 10 to the minus 15, not, um, so let's do this. Uh, we'll just say that this is 13, and we'll make this uh, What would the right number be here? This one would be 13, correct? What would this one up here be? Is 10 to the 12 correct? I don't think so. In part A, what should it be? 10 to the minus 2, minus 2, minus a uh, minus 15. 
What would it be? Be 13, wouldn't it? So I'm thinking. What's that? Right. Oh, this one is 17. Yes, thank you. I think I was thinking of the top one and writing on the bottom one. So thank you for keeping me honest. You are required to keep me honest. All right, so we are 10,000 times bigger. Our, our, we have 10,000 10, times as many cells as a hummingbird. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's got to be in the ballpark. Because, you know, a hummingbird is, it could hide one in my hand, all right? And, and there's not much to them, all right? So this at least makes sense, all right? So it's just, again, it's just a proportional reasoning problem that delivers an interesting factoid that you can impress your friends and relatives with, all right? So we'll get to some physics stuff. Speaking of something that's at least related to physics, cars going 33, what's its speed in kilometers per hour? By the way, you could just type this into a Google search line and it'll tell you the right answer right off the bat. However, that's not what I'm looking for in the homework. In the homework, you need to show some work. So if you wanna make sure you're right, just Google it, literally. If you type 33 meters slash M slash S, it'll already have two miles per hour, kilometers per se, it'll already come up with those things. And then it'll lead you to a, t a thing that lets you pick all sorts of different units for conversion, if you haven't seen that yet. So I'm a big fan of using technology. Uh, it's a calc-based course. We'll do some calculus. Uh, I trust that you already know how to do the math. And so I'm not going to, I'm not so much interested in you doing mind-busting mathematical derivations much. We will do a few. So if your calculator can deliver the answer, great. All right. You don't think that you need to become a mathematician for this course. Okay. A little bit, but for the most part, use the tech. All right. We're not here to test your calculus knowledge. We're here to use your calculus knowledge. Okay. All right. So meanwhile, back at the ranch, I got diverted there. Uh, we need to convert this to kilometers per hour. So I think there's a thousand kilometers. I'm sorry. There's a thousand meters in a kilometer. I think I need another coffee. And there's 3,600 seconds in an hour. So the meters die, the seconds die, and I have 33 times 3,600 divided by 1,000, okay? And so this uh, will work out to 118.8 kilometers per hour, okay? Now, that is what I will call a gross answer. And it is a gross answer because it did not pay one lick of attention to the significant digits. All right, so usually people in this course have already had some exposure to significant digits. And we'll actually have a problem or two where you have to like literally do the significant digits. So let's kind of cover that here since it's germane to this problem. We're not done answering it because this answer is, has more precision that is warranted for the inputs that we had. So if the digit is not zero, it's a significant digit. All non-zero digits are significant. Zeros between non-zero digits are significant. Zeros at the end of a number are significant because you're saying it's exactly that much. Zeros that would get obliterated by switching to scientific notation are not significant. So basically any zeros between the decimal point going to the right and your first non-zero digit, those are not significant digits because I could convert those to a, 10, uh, to a times 10 to the. So any zeros that could be converted into a something times 10 to the, those aren't significant digits. That's pretty much it unless 
I need more coffee. So how many significant digits do we really have in this problem? Two. This number here sort of makes it dicey because I just said that they're at the end of a number. Like if you have the nerve to write 0, 0.0, then you're saying that it's exact and that's impossible. There's no way we could actually have exactly 3,600 seconds or even exactly one gallon or one kilogram. The only things that can be exact are things you can count. Like I have exactly four tires on my car, exactly two nostril holes in my nose. All right, I, those are exact countable things, but if it requires a measurement, there's no such thing as an exact measurement. You can be super duper precise, like NASA laser beam precise. You know, we need like over, we need way more than 20 digits just to like get the space shuttle in orbit, you know, or go to the moon or something like that. Okay, uh, but nothing's exact, nothing's exact. Uh, no measurement or computation, and sometimes our measurements are the result of a computation. None of those are exact. They're just varying degrees of precision, all right? So we should write something like, if we were gonna put it in uh, scientific notation, we could write 1.2 times 10 to the two kilometers per hour. And that 1.2, is carrying that two significant digits. So whoever said two significant digits, you're right. That's a two significant digit problem because of the speed that we're converting. Now, here's the thing. This is four significant digits, but that's only two. Why do we pick two? That's our, it's the weakest link in the chain computationally. So anytime you um, are doing some computation, you, all, you hold as many digits as your calculator will let you hold until you're done computing. When you're down to the final output of the entire computational chain, then you go, what was the least number of significant digits? What was the weak, weakest link in my computational chain? The least precise number. However many digits it has that are significant, that's what you round to. All right, and so here we would need to either round, put it in scientific notation or say 120, yeah. Since they're all exact, it's assumptions. So this is, it, we, it takes a little bit of time to sort of uh, uh, get on board with the, nuances. I, I hear what you're saying. And so it's about your assumptions. Now, here's the reality. When you guys get out into the real world, either they're going to be following significant digits by the book or they won't. Uh, I was, uh, one summer I went to Oak Ridge National Lab on an internship right before I graduated um, as an undergrad. And one part of the lab I was working in, it, everything was three decimal places. And that was mainly because the nature of that work was that straightforward, that that was the most efficient thing to do. Just everything's three decimal places. And then there was another part of the lab that I went to where they did significant digits, religiously. This is all you did, only significant digits. And the nature of that work, it made sense there. So it just, it just depends on what you end up doing, what field you're in, what company you're working on, what project you're working on. And, but if you can do significant digits, you can do anything. Yeah. With uh, using significant digits, like we were to assume the numbers in the problem were exact and then we got an exact answer, uh, but using the significant digits decreases the answer, how likely will it be that we need to include the margin of error with the answer? Um, we're going to get to uncertainty, which is essentially that here in a minute. So uh, you'll know. Um, it'll be specified when you have to do it, but the baseline would be significant digits. And if you want to put the uncertainty in it, it wouldn't hurt, especially if it's asking for it. <laughs> so, but if it's not, it wouldn't hurt to do it anyways. If you know, if you have enough information, 
uh, we don't have enough information here other than to make a guess about uncertainty. All right. Tectonic plates. So I want to warn you, this problem starts off with a useful piece of information. In the middle, we obtain an entirely useless piece of information, and then we use that to make yet another useful piece of information. All right. And it's about the process more than the math, because the math is blindingly simple uh, math to do. So these plates are moving at four centimeters a year. That is roughly the Earth average. Some plates move a little faster, some plates move a little slower. Four centimeters a year. At one time, all of the plates were one big plate. And then they broke up because they had a fight. And, um, but they were so slow, it took them forever to get apart. And someday, a billion years from now or whatever, they'll all cram together again. Make new mountains, ruin people's vacation homes, etc. And then eventually they'll drift apart again and have an entirely new, new uh, geography two billion years or whatever out in the future. All right. Plate tectonics. Yay. If it wasn't for plate tectonics, we'd be dead. Uh, that whole system. Anybody had geology? Right. Uh, the, you know, one plate, two plates come together, something's got to give. Either they're going to do this or one of them's going to go under. It's going to sub this subduction zone. And so that whole process cycles Nutrients into the ocean gets rid of waste. It produces new. It's a whole thing. Our water cycle, blah blah blah. And um, we have just enough water, not too much or not too little, to actually have plate tectonics. If we had a little bit less water, no plate tectonics. If we had a little more water, no plate tectonics. And guess what? By mass, even though water covers seventy percent of the Earth, it's like 0.03 percent of the mass of the Earth insanely small amount of water on this planet not small for us but compared to the planet there's almost no water that's how big the earth is uh, and how small the amount of water is relative meanwhile back at the ranch the problem we were solving uh, so four centimeters per year all right so if we have four centimeters per year and I know that I want to get rid of the centimeters per year, or I need to get it into a spot where I can um, just say how far it went in one second. So I know I'm going to multiply by one second, but I got to get it to a spot where I can get rid of seconds and only have a unit of length. So that's what we're going to do. Basic conversion stuff. So we know that there's a hundred centimeters in a meter, and we know that uh, that gets us to meters. See, a year, didn't we already do this? I'll have to, uh, a year has 365.25 days. A day has 24 hours. An hour has 3,600 seconds. So here we are, years are gone, centimeters are gone. Days are gone, hours are gone, I have meters per second. All right, and so if I multiply this times one second, then my seconds are gone. And I would have some number of meters. I knew how far, I could have left it centimeters, but we did it. So if you were to be uh, doing the crunching of numbers there, you would get 1.3 times 10 to the ninth meters, or 1.3 nanometers. That's smaller than a piece of hair, okay? So nanometer, really short, super short uh, distance uh, that it moves in a second. Totally useless piece of information. Four centimeters per year, no wonder I don't notice the continents moving. That makes perfect sense useful piece of information that you can relate to. The fact that the continent moved a nanometer in one second, okay, not, not entirely useful. Mildly interesting, but not something that is entirely useful. But we answered the question and that was useful because we said so. So that was part A. Part B will get us to something that's useful uh, what's its speed in kilometers per million years? All right. 
So I have four centimeters per year. And again, 100 centimeters per meter, 1,000 meters per kilometer. So now I have the kilometers per. And there is 10 to the 6 years per mega year. And so the centimeters drop, the years drop, the meters drop. And I have some number of kilometers per mega year. And in fact, it's uh, 4 times 10 to the 6 kilometers per 10 to the 5th mega years, which is going to be 40 uh, kilometers per mega year. That's useful. Why is that useful? It's a prediction based on the initial data point that we had. It's basically good science. That is what we're here to do, make predictions. So I have this speed of a continental plate that is something that we, we geologists pay attention to. They've been measuring it for decades and it's basically been the same, all right? So this real data point that's really happening right now. And we're like, okay, well, what's gonna happen if that doesn't change? And we have good reasons to think that it won't change by enough to care about forever, really. Well until the plates run into each other, then it'll slow down inevitably, all right? Come to a stop momentarily until stuff breaks up. And so in <clears throat> 1 million years, we would expect our continent to be 40 kilometers to the left or right, depending on your perspective. And so 100 million years later, we would expect it to be, you know, uh, 4,000 kilometers or whatever, a billion years from now, you just do the math. You're multiplying by some power of 10. And you see that, wow, you know, in a billion years, we're going to be hundreds to thousands of kilometers towards in one direction. And, you know, how many kilometers are we from Europe? You know, it's 3,000 miles or something like that across the ocean. So we just got to go a few thousand kilometers and... And then we're running into another continent. All right, so that's the use utility. Uh, and it's basic stuff here. Sometimes it's much harder than this. Thing. All right. Suppose that your bathroom scale reads your mass as 65 kilograms, I wish, with a 3% uncertainty. All right, it's a lot of uncertainty for a scale, but all right. So now we're going to talk about uncertainty. And there... I personally don't really like the notation of doing uncertainty, but I get it. And so I'm going to, uh, for the moment here, just parrot what you'll find in your textbook. And then we can make sense of that notation and whatever workarounds we want that we think are more sensible, we'll go at it there. But it's not weird. And uh, for a calculus student, this could be irritating because they like to use this symbol that you would recognize as a partial derivative. Okay, in Calc 1, you would have been introduced briefly to partial derivatives, and then you use the heck out of them in, I think, Calc 3 or 2. I can't remember which one that first shows up in, all right? This is not a differential. This is really a formula, actually, because it's saying, take the uncertainty and multiply it to your mass. And I could have the uncertainty for speed. I could have this symbol V, the uncertainty for length L, we'll see all of these things, okay? So it's a, it's a notation. And so if you were reading this part of your textbook, you would see it asking you to, uh, and so for this problem, the uncertainty, what is the uncertainty? The uncertainty is 3%. So what, there's two ways to go about this. I can write 3% that way, okay? Because functionally, isn't that the same as saying 3%? Wouldn't 3 over 100 give me 0.03? And I would, that would be 3% of something if I put it in there? Yeah. All we're doing is obeying the formula because the formula says put the uncertainty over the full measure. That's, that's what the formula from your textbook is saying. And so then I'm going to multiply this by 65 kilograms. So really, when we 
take a close look at it, this notation, you know, is really, a, it's essentially working like a formula. All right, so it's based on a definition of the uncertainty of something. And the uncertainty is a percentage uh, or a percent uncertainty and then this other thing. So not a hard problem to solve, all right? So basically you're going to get two kilograms out of this, roughly. That's the uncertainty of the measure. That's a lot because a uh, kilogram is like two pounds, 2.2 pounds. That's a crummy scale, I'm taking it back. <laughs> it's four pounds off, <laughs> all right? I, that's no good, so simple. What's the uncertainty? All right, percent uncertainty. So here's this measuring tape. This gets a little bit clearer on uh, what we might mean by percent uncertainty. So percent uncertainty, unk for uncertainty, of some length, L, okay, would be defined as uh, the uncertainty of that length per unit length times 100%. So it's just this is just taking textbook approach to it here. Um, now, whether or not you end up using the textbook approach exactly as it's shown, I could care less. All right, if you get it this way, then use it that way. If you get it some other way, then use it that other way. Anybody had that algebra teacher in high school that if you, even if you got it right, if you didn't use their method, you were wrong? Yes, when I become emperor, those people will be flogged in public, all right? But there's never just one right way to get an answer. There's one right answer. There's at least two right ways to that answer. I don't need you to do it the way I show. I usually try to show multiple ways. In fact, you'll see that once we get to the real physics, we'll do it that way. Uh, you do not need to copy me exactly. You need a valid method that produces good answers. So if you have a little twist on what the book has or what I do, great. As long as it gets you right answers that are obtained validly, I'm all for that. Okay, so don't think you have to go buy the book, even though I'll do a bunch of buy the book kind of demonstrations. All right, and then I'll do plenty that are by van gilder's book as well this isn't one of them <laughs> so uh later on so what would this work out to be well the dl per l or whatever this little squiggle d thing is we were told that the uncertainty was 0.5 centimeters per 20 meters okay so first problem i have here is i need common units in this thing here so and, and here's the thing, I should get a pure number out of this because a length over a length is no unit of length. But before I do that, they have to be the same unit of length in order for that unit to cancel out. So we would basically just have 100 centimeters per meter basically kills all the units. So sometimes in your percent uncertainty calculation, you'll need to convert in order to have that work out the way that you would expect it to. Uh, let's see, uh, this would work out to be 2.5 times 10 to the minus two percent. That's weird. Cause if you were to convert 2.5 times 10 to the minus two to a decimal and forget that it was that much percent, you would write the wrong, you would write two and a half percent as your answer. And it's two and a half percent percent. This is way less than one percent. Okay, because it's 0.025 percent. It's not two and a half percent. That's this notation is it lures you into the wrong answer. So be mindful of that. Uh, so on a homework, if you wrote two and a half percent, I wouldn't kill you on that because I knew I would just say, yeah, you forgot the doohickey. But on a quiz, I'd have to ding you uh, for, for missing that point there. So what's its percent uncertainty? So it's relatively, I mean, it's arithmetic, just understanding the notation and this little maneuver here and not mistaking 
that as the percentage. Okay. All right. Significant figures. We need to look at this and go, okay. When I do this computations, what should I, how many significant digits should I report? So as I said earlier, the least number of significant digits is what you round to after you do all the computations. So if you look here, that's four significant digits. That's five significant digits, but this one and this one are both three. Those are the smallest number of significant digits in our game. So three is for that one. Same here, three significant digits, I square it. I guarantee you'll get more than three digits decimal places. You'll get, you know, probably six decimal places. You can just round it to, to three. So this is also three significant digits because there's only three significant digits in the computation. Because how would you write it out? You would normally write this out if you were doing it the hard way, isn't that the definition of squaring it? Two numbers, both same significant digits, three, okay? Then down here, uh, this has four significant digits, but this is three significant digits. So all three of these answers have three significant digits. And remember, uh, uh, never round until the end. You've, you've surely encountered making that mistake and being wrong because you propagated rounding error throughout your computation. So we always save it to the end. Yes. Uh, no, any computation. It wouldn't matter. You just... You take everything as it is, carry more precision than the least significant digit uh, demands, because that's something we do at the very last thing. Uh, uh, we only pay attention, we use the least significant number of digits at the last step, not before the last step. Yeah, so yes. Well, uh, technically, yeah. I mean, we, we probably wouldn't because we're assuming that that's an exact number. So we would. You, then you're thinking it's fifty-seven point zero times two. And it's two times two point two. You know, it's those are the. Yeah. Right. So my short answer is we'll cross those nuanced bridges when we get to them. Uh, in this case, it's we're just doing the very basic, straightforward, so you can succeed on this homework sort of thing. But you're right; it gets there are certain times where it's like, eh, how do I really apply that one? You know, how do I fudge it? And you have to you basically you have to make an assumption and run with it. Yeah. Say that again. Uh-huh. No, I'm just I'm just ex I'm agreeing explicit about this is expanding it based on the definition of an exponent and in both cases I have three significant digits. So the product, the least number of significant digits is the number of significant digits, 3. I'm not saying you have to do it this way. This was to illustrate No. No, it's the inputs. So it's a good question. Significant digits is based on the inputs to a computation before you computate. I made that word up, okay? At least I think I made it up. I don't think there's, a, I'll, I'll go online and find out that computate is a word, even though I don't think it is. Well, it, the 57 would have two. Right, or times two, you'd have to say 100. Mm -hmm. But we want to say, well, I know that's 14. I know it's 14. If I had 57 wheels, 
in one pile and 57 wheels in another pile, then I know I have 114 wheels. Now, in that case, you could probably ditch significant figures because you are dealing with measurable, countable quantities. Then we don't care about the significant digits because we absolutely know it's accounting as opposed to a measure. So that's where the nuance comes in, is knowing what it is you're computing. Because really, if you have 57 things and you're just counting 57 things twice, then you have exactly 114 things. But if it's 57 is a measurement, you don't have exactly 57. You would have to report, uh, if you're doubling a measure, you would report 100. That's that's the one of the nuanced things is what is it a count or is it a measure? No, accuracy and exact are different. We'll get into that. So we're off in the weeds. I want to come back out of the weeds, but you have, these are valid questions and we will, we will go there. Okay. And we can go there maybe right after this. And we certainly will go there as we get to those more complicated situations, but it's a, you're, you're right to flinch at, at what's being said. All right. So moving on a person's blood pressure is 120 plus or minus two millimeters of mercury. What's its percent uncertainty? All right. So part A, percent uncertainty. Again, we're just, what's the relative frequency, really? The per, relative percentage. It's a, we're asking for a percentage. All right. What percent of 120 is two? It's really what we're asking. So we can go back to that formula where it's the uncertainty uh, of uh, the blood pressure, you know, relative to the blood pressure times 100 percent. We could go buy the book with the formula, but what are we asking for? Uh, we're asking for this two millimeters per 120 millimeters. All right. That's all we're asking for of mercury. I'll just leave the mercury. There we go. Times 100%. So it's <clears throat> it's what you expect it to be. And here's this formula that every textbook that deals with uncertainty, they all kick around that same formula. It's just the jargon, the notation, <coughs> excuse me, of that game. Okay, take it or leave it. And so this works out to be if you do not pay attention to significant digits. It's 0.0593%, which you would write as 0.059% with the three uh, significant digits um, or the, um, the two <laughs> uh, in there, the two, whatever. So really, uh, I'm not sure that you really gain much the difference between these two. So sometimes I'm just sort of like, yeah, why bother? It doesn't really make a meaningful difference. Depends. It just depends. And as we go, we will pin down more of those little nuanced things as we go and examine them and try to sort out how to make those decisions. Maybe somebody will volunteer to make a flow chart and uh, we'll be uh, done that. Then, then they ask, well, what's the uncertainty in a blood pressure measurement of 80 millimeters of mercury? So the uncertainty, which is this little goopy little delta uh, symbol for the um, blood pressure would be... Uh, Oh, wait a minute. I'm reading the wrong, my notes. Told you I needed more coffee. This is from the next problem. <laughs> Sorry about that. Glad I cut that. So you guys are supposed to be doing computations with me. Uh, 
two out of 120 should be a little bit smaller than before. This is a uh, 1.7% or 2%. So, uh, man, I'm going to get me some big old tea when I go over to my next class. All right. Sorry about that. Everybody clear why that, the mistake I made? All right. I'm looking at my notes and reading the next problem. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, crap. Ooh. So, sorry about that. All right, so now, if I want the, the actual uncertainty of a particular uh, blood pressure reading, then I need the percent uncertainty in order to do an actual uncertainty. Is that, that clear? I want to make sure it's clear because I just took myself up in an adventure in the weeds here. All right. So if I want to measure the uncertainty, I must have a percent uncertainty. Otherwise, I can't, me I can't compute the uncertainty unless I have a percentage uncertainty. All right. So that would just be this 1.7 percent. So we wouldn't we wouldn't use 2 percent because that's this and that's the rounded version of it. We would use the 1.7 percent out of 100 percent, which is the same as 1.7 percent. And we would multiply that times the reading that we want, the uncertainty of that reading, which would be the 80 millimeters of mercury. And so that. Where to go? That's 1.3. 1 1.3 millimeters mercury. Or you might just say, uh, here's anybody willing to venture why the correct answer in significant digits is one? Why is it the case that my correct answer? dealing with significant digits needs to be one millimeter mercury. It's the two. It's the plus or minus two. You see that? All right, it's a, the, in this case, that's a little, this right here is driving why my actual uncertainty for that reading wouldn't be 1.3 millimeters, it would be one. So there is a, just to warn you, I have seen entire, um, it was either an entire course or like half of a course just on measurement issues, largely dealing with uncertainty. There are a ton of statistical maneuvers. I mean, this, we're doing the kid stuff because it's day one, okay? Uh, and most of what we do doesn't require stuff that's gonna happen at a higher level. But I mean, th there's a whole statistical toolbox for actually obtaining these uncertainty values, the plus or minus parts. Uh, it, it is quite an enterprise measurement uncertainty. You, you could sp literally specialize in it, all right? And if you end up working in a research lab, you will specialize in it whether you want to or not, because you must be the you have to be accurate, high, high levels of precision and accuracy, and that's a statistical, largely a statistical maneuver, um, and then basic stuff like this, and so the data drives the way that this happens sometimes. Okay, like I said, we're doing the kid stuff; it gets more gnarly. All right. Uh, as you move up in the food chain analysis. All right. Here's one. Marathon runner. We want to know uh, in the first part of this problem, what's the percent uncertainty in distance and what's the uncertainty in elapsed time? So um, let me get my pen back here. Part A. What do we want? We want the percent uncertainty in the distance. I'll use D for distance. All right. So again, that's a relative percentage. It's just a relative frequency, basically. So I have 25 meters. That's the, uh, where did it say that? 
It's supposed to say 25 meters right there. I thought I fixed this. I must have grabbed the wrong one. That should say 25 meters. Sorry. <laughs> had the same problem in the morning group and it had the updated version. So of course their lecture had different, had some of the same problems, some different. Uh, anyway, so 25 meters. If you were had your book open to pay part of 83, it says 25 meters. You probably see it right there. Uh, 42.188 kilometers. <laughs> kilometers. All right. So that's going to be a percentage once I change it to um, uh, get rid of the uh, these units. So there's a thousand meters in a kilometer. So this drops out. And so that right there is going to be that percentage or the relative uh, frequency. And then if we want to go by the book with this thing here, and what this is the one that had the 0.0593%, which I would report as 0.059%. That's the uncertainty. I'm sorry, the percent uncertainty in the distance. Yes. Uh, it's supposed to be, it didn't make it into the typed out problem, so I wrote it in there. Sorry about that. If you look at number 83 in the book, it actually has that 25 meters right in there. So just a, it fell out of the slide for whatever reason. Uh, so that's, that's the percent uncertainty in the distance. So think of it, 25 meters out of 42,000 meters. Okay, so I would expect it a really small percentage. In fact, I would expect less than 1%. All right, so that's the uncertainty. Uh, and why, why is it a 25 meter uncertainty in the distance? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But if you think about it, what do we mean by uncertainty? If you had to guess, it's half of the smallest unit that you're able to measure. So if you had an inch, a ruler that only had single integer inch values, no quarter, half, whatever, you would have to say the uncertainty is half an inch. You, you pick half of the interval that you can't see. So on a, a meter stick, the smallest interval is a millimeter. So the uncertainty in a meter stick is half a millimeter. Or you, sometimes you just say it's the smallest unit. People are loosey-goosey with the rules. Uh, it wouldn't be any larger than the smallest unit. Agreed? The uncertainty of a measure couldn't be bigger than the large, the smallest unit that you can measure with on that device. And it, uh, it wouldn't be reasonable to say it's smaller than half of it. It's got to, you know, the smallest it could be is somewhere in between that smallest chunk that's measurable on that device. Okay. Yes. You're not allowed to ask questions like that. Remember, these are problems based on assumptions. We are not trying to determine whether or not they should have written the problem this way. We take the problem as it comes. So, I mean, it's a good question, but it doesn't help us with the homework. It's a deeper question that uh, we would have to kick around somewhere else. And so um, um, I don't mean to shut you down, but it's, uh, it's not something that will, you know, why is it that way? Certainly they can have a smaller uncertainty than 25 meters with GPS. Or that's some really crummy GPS, you know. Then maybe it's where the race is. We don't have very many cell towers, so the uncertainty is bigger. There you go. I just saved myself. But, uh, but you're right. You would expect it 25 meters. That seems awfully large. That's 25 yards. You're off by 25 yards? could lose the race if I'm off between parts, you know? Uh, so yeah, you're right. But it is, you know, what it is is what it is. Okay. So at least the way the problem stated. All right, then calculate the uncertainty in the elapsed time. So if I had two hours, 30 minutes and 12 seconds, maybe I should like convert that to seconds or something. Okay. So two hours would be two times 3,600 seconds. 30 minutes 
would be 1800 seconds. So what is that? 7,200 times 18 or times 18 plus 1800 is uh, 9,200, 9,100. No, what did I say? I said, I said 7,200. 1800 so we have 9102 seconds 9012 seconds when we add it all up right i need man if i could just beam one of those big arizona iced teas from the bookstore to here man i need to just start chugging that thing right now all right so if we do the math on the seconds, we know we have 9,100 or 9,012 seconds, okay? So we could do the percent uncertainty in time, all right? And say, since I had an uncertainty of one second for the whole race, the how long it took for the race to do, uh, out of 9,012 seconds now this makes sense because if you have a stopwatch probably if it's an old stopwatch the smallest unit is a second so this is a decent this is a much more believable uncertainty of one second okay of course in reality if you have a digital stopwatch you probably have thousands of a second is your uncertainty in in reality right so uh, this is going to give us an insanely small um, uncertainty or percent uncertainty and so this ends up being if you carry around the full precision it's this and you would report it as just 0.01 percent and you're doing that because the actual uncertainty is one significant digit what's that The, uh, you, you use them to maybe uh, uh, compute the interval. In fact, I, I think we're going to have a problem where we actually determine what, what range would I expect to find the answers. And this will be related to confidence intervals in statistics, which is based on a standard deviation, which is essentially the average deviation from the mean value. And often our uncertainty measure is statistically from a whole set of measurements. I have this average plus or minus some you know, the board was three feet long, plus or minus an inch. And we got that from a standard deviation, most likely. That's one of the ways that you have an uncertainty, is statistically from taking a bunch of measurements of the same process in that regard. So uh, now the second part of this is, what's the average speed in meters per second? Uh, though we haven't covered motion yet, I'm pretty sure that you've all been behind the wheel of a car and seen the speedometer and notice that it's in units of distance per unit time, right? So I don't think we have trouble calculating speed. You calculated it in a college algebra course. You've uh, done the uh, first derivative of a position equation in calculus, so you've done speed, all right? So I don't uh, need to labor that one. So the average speed, is going to be just the distance per unit time so 42.188 kilometers per 9012 seconds and we're going to do a, a uh, thousand meters per kilometer that gets us into meters per second and so we have this 4.681 meters per second and we choose four significant digits because 9,012 has four significant digits. We had more significant digits in the distance, but we had less in the time. So that's what we go with. So then what's the uncertainty in the average speed? This one, a little bit more involved here. And so there are times in the uncertainty game where you multiply the uncertainties. And then there are times where you add the uncertainties. This is a case where we add them. The reason we add them is because mainly they're different units of measure. They're, they're compounding in a different way 
than say a volume or an area where all the dimensions, all the measurements are the same quantity, type of quantity, a length quantity or something like that. So the rules for that are more explicitly given in the book, but I will just say that the percent uncertainty in the speed will be the percent, I should say uncertainty there, uncertainty in the two different measures. So I have percent uncertainty in distance plus percent uncertainty in time. So the percent uncertainty in distance was uh, that 0.0593%. I'm going back to the precision that exceeds the significant digits. I wouldn't want to bring in my rounded values to do this with. I want to go back to my uh, ones that ignore significant digits so that I can do this right. And then the other one was 0.1%. Uh, and then you add this up, you get like 0.0704%. But again, you would report that as 0.07% because of the two uh, significant uh, well, you would, uh, let's see, if we added 0.01 to 0.059, you would have what? 0.069? And would that round to 0 0.07? Yeah, I would. Here's the rub. The reason I say this is every now and then, if the numbers are just right, you you'll you'll round to the wrong uh, number. So in this case, it wasn't necessary to go back to the full precision that was beyond what the significant digit should do. I'm just saying as a matter of practice, you should. You wanna go back to that point where you were unconcerned with significant digits, get the full precision, even though it's not warranted for your final answer. You understand why? And the only reason you do that is sooner or later, you're going to carry forward rounding error if you don't do that. Okay. And so in this case, it wouldn't have mattered either way. Sometimes it does. I would say that probably usually it doesn't. You're not, it's a less likely error. And as long as we're not going to the moon, it really wouldn't matter much in real life. All right. But uh, being off by a hundredth at that speed, well, yeah, that would do. Uh, it could ruin your day, well, your life, uh, quite honestly. Uh, good, good on time. All right. Last problem. Length, width of a rectangular room are measured to a really high level of precision, 3.955 plus or minus 5 millionths, I'm sorry, thousandths of a meter, and a similar one uh, for the width. So we have length here, width there, just for clarity's sake, all right? Calculate the area of the room and its uncertainty in square meters. All right, so here's the thing. There's an uncertainty in the length and there's an uncertainty in the width. That means there's going to be an uncertainty in the area. So I need to know the percent uncertainty in length and width so I can obtain the percent uncertainty in area. Once I have the percent uncertainty in area, I can compute the area with its percent uncertainty. So there's these pieces of the puzzle that uh, normally when you compute area, you don't have to bother with all this. But normally you're not in a physics class, so there you go. So let's uh, go through the the thing here. So percent uncertainty for width uh, will be the standard 005 per the 305. So this is going to work out to be if you divide those things, you'll get. 0.16%, that's the percent uncertainty, so less than 1% uncertainty, all right? The percent uncertainty in length is going to be the 
double the five again, but over a different uh, measure. That's going to work out to 0.13% uncertainty. All right. So the percent uncertainty in area is also going to be an, an additive process. Percent uncertainty width plus percent uncertainty length. And so when you add those two things, you get 0.29% uh, uncertainty in the area, which you would push down to 0.3% area uncertainty, All right? So this is another one where we add, and I'm uh, spacing on when we multiply. Um, I have to come back to that at some other time when my brain is fully on board here. So the, pers the uncertainty of the area would just be this 0.29% uh, per 100% times the, uh, we didn't compute the area yet, but that's simple. Area would be uh, length times width, or if you do the math, it's 12.06 square meters. If you punch that out on, a, on your calculator, I trust you can do that. Uh, essentially four times three. <laughs> you know, it's gotta be 12 something, and it ain't 12 much. So this is our actual area. So we would put 12.06 square meters and this was going to so what would be the uncertainty of the area it would have to be the percent uncertainty of the area times the area the percentage of the areas to get this thing so we get this uh should be really small 0. 0.035 square meters or 0. 0.04 square meters so the area are you familiar with that is therefore Seen that before in math class? Triple the little triangle dots means a therefore. Okay, now you know. <laughs> it's a little notation. So the area, if I wanted to fully report an area measurement, it just wouldn't be the area. It would be the area with its uncertainty. Okay. So area would be 12.06 uh, plus or minus the point oh four square meters. That would be the area plus its uncertainty. So really, you wouldn't expect much uncertainty, you know, unless you have a really crummy tape measure, All right? You expect it to be a little bit better. Now they got apps for this where you can just scan it. Everything done. That's it.